Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today, we're going to feature four outstanding astronaut ladies, as this is March Women's History Month. So we're going to feature four women who, who were orbiting the Earth in March. Uh, you're, a couple of them you might know well, and the other two you might not know so well. But one of them's going to end our program with, sh I'm going to share her thoughts on how the Hollywood blockbuster movies of the last 10, 15 years, maybe, how some of your favorites stacked up to her in the eyes as an astronaut who also consults on movies. So stay curious about that today. We've got our beautiful peninsula of Florida behind me here on our green screen. Marty Winkle, my co-producer and a friend for three years of Stay Curious. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you all for watching. And tell your friends to watch us on YouTube as we've monetized YouTube and looking to grow that channel. And we're also very grateful that we've been busy at the museum. A lot of people coming in the museum. We've got the Japanese Florida group that brings 30 students to, uh, they brought them three times this month in here already. Uh, some great friends have already coming in and visiting us. So hope that you can plan your vacation down here in this beautiful peninsula of Florida here. Uh, and of course, we're up there, a little bit of cloud cover in the picture there, right up above my head. There's where Marty and I are talking from, the little horn that comes out from the east side of the coast. We are exactly 10 miles away from Kennedy Visitors Complex and all of the rocket launch pads out there. And... Uh, just three blocks from one of the great places to watch a launch at Space View Park. So we wanted to let everybody know that full steam ahead for Shuttle Fest 2. You can blast the QR code there and register or pay $15 instead of $20 at the door. We're going to feature the documentary on the base to space, the mobile launch platform too, which might not sound that exciting, but it is. It's what the, the this beautiful Ann Miklos photograph in the background, that's what the shuttle's on top of. It's quite a engineering marvel of its own. You're going to learn about that. And we've got several other panels that are going to be talking about, including the space artist Chris Callie uh, spearheading a uh, art panel at the end of the day. So we'll be talking about that the next two weeks and hope that you can watch it on our uh, video channel. It'll be on Facebook and YouTube broadcast live to you there. So, well, we also are very blessed that the Go History Travel Organization has supported us financially. And uh, we met the leaders of that last week. Uh, so grateful for their donation to our Stay Curious program. It's going to allow us to go out and travel and buy some equipment to do some remotes. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Rama, Mal, and Bharat for uh, your contribution. Please go check out Go History Travel. They post a very unique newsletter that has a, a, a real mixed bag of places they visited not just in our country, but around the world. And they were in Rome and purposely went to where Mike Collins, the Apollo and Gemini astronaut, was born in Rome. So you're going to find it a very interesting site, Go Travel. Well, in this date in space history, Marty, we were talking about it before, 63 years ago, Mercury astronauts were doing their first open water egress training outside their space capsule. I find it odd, Marty, we call it Mercury Capsule and Gemini Capsule, but it become a spaceship during the shuttle era, of course. Well, between today, March 28th, and April 1st, 1960, astronauts were in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, working with the Navy School of Aviation and Medicine. The training was in 10-foot uh, swells. There we have Scott Carpenter, the, the second American to orbit the Earth. And here we've Wally Shira piddling around with something in her life raft. The egress time out of the Mercury spacecraft was four minutes from a completely restrained condition in the spacecraft to being in a life raft. So from being restrained with her uh, getting out of it was a four minute process. And here's uh, well, was Gus, uh, Scott Carpenter, Wally Shira, and, uh, ooh, didn't have the one pop up there. I thought it would, of Gus sitting in there. 
uh, must have had an anomaly there on our slides. But uh, so that's an important training. And also in 1960, these guys had just been named in about six months earlier as America's astronauts. So here they were in the heat of, tra of uh, training. And also on this date in history, do you all know what that is? Yeah, that's the first concept of the Manned Earth Orbiting Laboratory suggested 60 years ago today by NASA Associate Administrator Robert Siemens Jr. He's put together a task force to study the concept of what later become known as a Man Orbiting Research Lab, M-O-R-L, which then was just shortened to Mole, which never flew. But what's interesting about this picture, Marty, is you see solar panels on it, but look at the spacecraft attached to it at the top. That's a, a Mercury or Gemini capsule that is the docking port apparently there. That's kind of weird. Uh, next to what looks like, well, you have an aft, you have one end that has both nozzles on it. So don't know if those are engines or not. Well, they were already thinking Department of Defense being involved in this, of course, as it's a, it's a high ground for military to spy from. But uh, Siemens, who's a famous figure in the early days of NASA, Robert Siemens, the associate administrator, uh, he, uh, uh, to, uh, of course, James Webb, uh, Hyatt's team uh, uh, thought that the, there's a broad applications in space sciences, research, and technology. And today, of course, we have the International Space Station uh, orbiting the Earth for 22 years. It's been continuously occupied. And one of the features of it is the cupola. And thank you, Carlton Bailey, for sending me this picture of the cupola at the Space Shuttle um, SSPF, Space Shuttle Processing Facility. There you see the windows are covered up. They have them numbered one through six cover them up periodically. I don't know how that works if the astronaut pushes a button when they go up there to chill out. But uh, this is a picture taken in 19, uh, 2009 time frame because the cupola was put up by STS-130 in February 2010. And our good friend there, Nicole Stott, with a beautiful t-shirt on there that says Hope, looking out the cupola over probably the Pacific Ocean there. And uh, what a, what a to, to see that there, Carlton Bailey, CB, I know you're watching, to watch it there and look at you had the privilege of photographing it. Uh, his note told me they just saw it from one side. They weren't allowed to walk around it there. And there's a another uh, press person in front of uh, CB there to get you the perspective but uh, and there's Nicole Stott in it not that big but with the windows it is an expansive of the universe looking down at the earth there so thank you Nicole Stott also for all she does to support outreach and art in space that is her passion she has a website art uh, space foundation well, Women's History Month, and we're to what we were talking about. Maynette Smith, you said you'd be watching today. Umberto Lopez is in Armenia watching us today. James Sigler, thank you for being along. Maris Krasinski is, we've mentioned her name that I slaughter every time I say it, Krasinski. She is in Matyets, Poland. Thank you for watching, Marius. And Benjamin Brown's watching from Lakeland, Florida. At least said that they would be Marty as they we post our teaser to uh, our what are we on about 782 episodes today and I didn't even know ahead of time most days three years ago what I was going to post uh, what I was going to do to even post something in advance so we've come a long way but let's look at some four women that uh, made a difference out there and have inspired women and men with their missions to space. I'm going to start off each lady with a uh, a meme from another female astronaut. And this one, of course, from Sally Ride, America's first female to go to space. She passed away about 20 years ago of leukemia. She says, I would like to be remembered as someone who is not afraid to do what she wanted to do and as someone who took risks along the way in order to achieve her goals. 
very humble when you know the, the story of Sally Ride. She uh, deflected a lot of the fame of her being the first American woman. Uh, and uh, she operated the shuttle arm on two flights, was training for her third flight uh, when the Columbia disaster happened. But we want to feature first Nancy Curie Gregg. All right. And Nancy Curie Gregg has four shuttle flights. She was born in, uh, she was born Nancy Jane Decker is her maiden name in Wilmington, Delaware on December 29th, 1958. Uh and, but her family moved to Troy, Ohio when she was young, and she considers Troy, Ohio to be her hometown. That is above uh, Cincinnati, between Cincinnati and Dayton, a thriving little suburb of, of Cincinnati, actually. Um, she graduated from the Ohio State University, go Buckeyes, like me. Uh, she has a Master of Science degree in, in, in Safety Engineering from uh, USC, University of Southern California, and her doctorate in industrial engineering from the University of Houston. She's an army uh, colonel. That's how her segue into um, being an astronaut was 23 years of service to our country in the army. Uh, she was on the rotary wing pilot training, so she knows how to fly helicopters. And uh, let me see here about her, her of my notes I have together. Uh, we've got another picture of her here. Afterlife. Look at this picture. And then some women really changed their appearances there. And that's what she looks like the last couple years ago. And uh, she has became the, in, the deputy director and chief technology officer at the Texas A&M in, in the development complex there. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But during her fourth and final shuttle flight, STS-109, Curry served as a flight engineer, Mission Specialist 2. All right. Now, she has 41 days in space on her uh, four shuttle missions, and that makes sense, each about 10 days old. Once in orbit, Curie's primary responsibility was to operate the shuttle's remote manipulator arm, the 50-foot robotic arm. And here she is training for that mission. No, she's doing it, obviously. She's not training, Marty. And how, what tipped me off? She's either jumping up and down or she's weightless there. Um, her duties were to retrieve and deploy the telescope, uh, doing some upgrades. There were five separate spacewalks that she was very involved in. Now, her quote is, I think pilots make good robotic arm operators because you're used to manipulating an aircraft and always knowing where you are. Uh, so, uh, and, and one of her astronaut uh, fellows, Dr. Rick Linneman, concurred that Nancy was one of the best arm operators I've ever known. And um, she was on the staff at Johnson Space Center for a while, a principal engineer for NASA's Engineering and Safety Center. Of course, safety is one of the first things I really learned is the culture of the NASA uh, employees and their contractors, learning that from Marty, who of course worked for United Space Alliance on the shuttle engines and then for Grumman before that on the lunar module. But Marty's safety is always something that you had a meeting about, right? And, and here's one of the key people of NASA safety stuff. Here she is, manip uh, she manipulated this this a national asset that's outperformed itself now in its 30, coming up on 33 years, designed to, to last for 10, uh, completely revolutionized astronomy, and then in tandem with the Webb telescope, we're learning so much more. So there you have Nancy Curie, uh, Greg. Uh, uh, she um, has been at the Institute of Industrial System Engineers in Applied Ergonomics. Uh, conferences of such. Uh, she was over here at Orlando last year uh, talking about that. And uh, she's a very good expert in human vibration models on spacecraft too, I found very interesting. So uh, found her niche. Uh, she is indeed 60, uh, would she be 60? Yep, she'd be 67 years old. Uh, take that back. Make it 65. Sorry, Nancy Gregg there. 
So she's hit her golden years there. Looks great for her age there in her home, obviously, with her army. When her helmets, they always have a little some mementos. Some a lot and some very few when you visit an astronaut's home. Uh, like I've had the pleasure to. So thank you, Nancy Curie Greg, for making a great example. Uh, she is a mother uh, with one uh, child, I believe. And uh, from her first marriage, she had her second husband die of cancer. For, and uh, so she's been through the ringer there. Nancy Curie Greg, one, uh, one of our most experienced women astronauts with four flights and 44 days in space. A quote from Chopna Kaula, who lost her life, of course, in the Columbia accident, but she did have one successful space flight. And I want to inspire you with what this beautiful lady says, that the path from dreams to success does exist. May you have the vision to find it, the courage to get on to it, and the presence to follow it. Wishing you a great journey. And she was always filled with this, have happiness all your life don't do anything begrudgingly look at the happy side of it uh, this is one of the strong messages from Kalp Nachala, lost in our columbia accident but that's a preface to celebrate tamara jernigan on our uh march month of women in uh, tamara jernigan was born in chattanooga tennessee but she grew up in Santa Fe Springs, California. And that's an interesting thing, Marty, where a lot of states lay claim, like you hear me bragging about the 24, 25 astronauts from Ohio, but some of them were just born there and as a baby were trucked out somewhere else, like she was. Well, not actually trucked out or maybe not even a baby, but she uh, was born, like I said, in Chattanooga and uh, attended Santa Fe High School in, in California, went to Stanford, so, and then University of Berkeley, uh, and then Rice University, okay? She studied physics and astronomy, uh, and then she is really a smart person because she ended up at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory as the Deputy Principal Associate Director in the Weapons and Complex Integration Organization. So this woman knows some top secrets, I guarantee you, Marty. Five space shuttle flights for Tamara Jernigan, 63 days in space. She and um, uh, Nancy Gregg were pre-ISS training astronauts. So these ladies were given about as much time in space as you could possibly get uh, uh, without being on the space station. Of course, her March flight was Astro 2 in uh, Astro 2 and my shuttles of the month, uh, which I got in front of me here. Let me act like I know what I'm doing here. Astro 2 is March, uh, was my March 2nd uh, launch in 1995. And uh, she was also on four other shuttle flights. She's got one EVA for uh, seven hours in space. Here she is training for STS-63. Uh, I mean, 67, which was the uh, Astro 2, or for the second time, this tele suite of telescopes was taken up to space, all right? And uh, she started her NASA career in 81 at the Ames Research Center. So she, she was in a theoretical physics for NASA before she was selected as an astronaut candidate in 1985. Three times uh, Tamara has been on... Um, Columbia and then Endeavor and Discovery. And here she is with her husband, astronaut, uh, Jeffrey Wissoff. All right. And, she, and Jeffrey is also an experienced traveler. He's got four flights, though. So she's her with five's got the bragging rights. Can you? They, they have a son between them. And uh, it's Peter or Jeff Wissoff. And uh, they have a child. Uh, he also works at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. All right. Now imagine them in the cafeteria. Between them, they've got nine shuttle flights uh, over 100 days in space. She's, they each have one spacewalk. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, a couple made in space. Uh, look at the, 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 they became, uh, attracted to each other and lovers and married you know through their space career and what a rich career both of them have had 
uh, Tamara was the deputy chief of the astronaut office also. Uh, big responsibility, managing the military and civilian astronauts. So, you know, an inspiration to women everywhere, uh, Tamara Jernigan, uh, a happily married uh, wife to an astronaut. And our first African-American female to go to space, uh, Mae Jamison. She just was a one and done astronaut, but segued into a career of public speaking. And I like this, Marty. Never be limited by other people's imagination and never limit others because of your own limited imagination. A double entendre there, okay? That uh, So uh, that tells me to be humble uh, and, and acceptance of what other people want to do, whether I believe in it or understand it or not. So, And that's a way to introduce you to this uh, wonderful astronaut, another four-time astronaut in space, all right? Uh, there's four, eight, and five. There's 13. I was going to add up their days before. Had Linda Godwin. And there's Linda's uh, signing an official NASA uh, or photograph of her uh, when she was chosen as an astronaut, nervous as can be, wearing that blue flight suit maybe for the first time, uh, got her hair just right and so forth. Well, this Dr. Linda Maxine Godwin was born in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, but she considers Jackson, Missouri to be her hometown. July 2nd, 1952. So, uh, yes, she's 71 years old or going to be this year. Just 70. Don't push it, Mark. And uh, same age as I am, basically. Or, uh, so she's a member of Physic, uh, Physical Society, the 99s, which is a women's organization. Uh, she, re she married astronaut Stephen Nagel, who was the commander of her first flight. In, uh, and he died of cancer uh, August 21st, 2014. So another woman who married an astronaut. Uh, uh, so we'll go back to May. Let's go forward here, Mark. There we go. Uh, there's her March uh, shuttle of May, or her March shuttle, STS-76, March 22nd, uh, 1996. Uh, and this was uh, a, uh, a rendezvous with the uh, Mirror Space Station that you see there, all right, and dropping Shannon Lucid off. Uh, so that was quite a mission that she got to see. She was... Um, a mission specialist working the robotic arm. All right. Her first mission was 37, the Camp de, uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. That's a good one. Here she is in space. All right. There's Linda in space. Um, on uh, STS-108, uh, I believe, the Endeavor mission to the space station to take supplies. So, uh, and she was on Endeavor twice in atlantis twice of her fourth four missions there 38 days in space like i said uh for four missions in space there's certainly a not much information about her on some of these um the mirror docking had to be the highlight of her career and then they flew uh, a segment up to the international space station in 2001 and what she does afterwards in, in flight uh uh, she worked at NASA afterwards uh, in her career. Here she is, uh, and she does lectures at universities. And there is Linda Godwin, all right, another four-time shuttle astronaut. Uh, and these three women that have gotten now 13 missions be between them. Uh, I want, I'm going to kind of maybe look at the women again one day, Marty, and... and uh, Having this many missions, and not many men have four missions, is what I'm trying to say. And with men dominating the astronaut corps, all right, these are some special women to be chosen four times to go to space and five times for Tamara. And we've got another five-time flyer to feature next. And she's the one that's going to share with you uh, her opinions about some of the latest Hollywood movies. But first, as I get a sip of coffee there for Women's History Month, is Ellen Ochoa. She was the first Hispanic female astronaut, the uh, second female director of Johnson Space Center. 
And she took a different stance. Uh, quote here, what everyone in the astronaut corps shares in common is not gender or ethnic background, but the motivation, perseverance, and desire, the desire to participate in a voyage of discovery. And every shuttle flight was a voyage of discovery, if not personally for each astronaut, for the shuttle orbiter itself, new things to be discovered about them, uh, uh, the way to get them back to space, and then, of course, the fabulous uh, science or interplanetary spacecraft that were released from the cargo bay and done in the cargo bay. So, uh, indeed, a great inspirational quote from a woman that uh, is really an inspiration to many, particularly in the Houston area, as leading Johnson Space Center. And that's going to feature our way into talking about Marsha Ivins. Marsha Ivins here being suited up in her pumpkin suit for one of her five flights. She was born in Baltimore, Maryland, but again, mostly grew up in the Philadelphia area uh, of Wallingford, Pennsylvania. And she, she graduated from Nether Providence High School in Wallingford, Pennsylvania in 1969. She worked on the space shuttle this displays, consoles, man-machine engineering, and the development of the orbiter's heads-up display. Of course, Marsh is pretty well known for having the coolest hair in space. Here she is on one of her missions showing off her long locks. She's age 71, and she keeps her hair very long and um, still. She served in Johnson's aircraft operations as a flight engineer for the shuttle training aircraft and co-pilot of the Gulfstream One. Selected as an astronaut in 1985, she spent more than uh, 55 days in space. All right, five shuttle missions. So the four ladies I've talked to you about have 18 shuttle missions in a cumulative of about 200 days in space. She spent 55 days overall, like I said, before retiring to become a space consultant for movies. All right. And um, uh, she uh, has, has narrated uh, some movies. She was involved with uh, IMAX as a beautiful planet 3D. All right. Uh, she claims that being inspired here, I want to show her signature. There's her flight was STS-62 in the month of March. And STS-62 was a mission that was focused on uh, the Earth resources. All right. Uh, and that was, let's see what orbiter that was. I think it was Columbia. Yes, Columbia. Uh, that had the microgravity payload in it. They did crystal growth. She's been to the Mir space station on its fifth docking. She helped deliver the U.S. module Destiny in space. Here's Marcia again with some photo gear, uh, uh, doing an IMAX movie up there. Uh, let's see, I see Columbia, tw uh, Atlantis twice, Columbia three times, uh, uh, Atlantis three times, and Columbia twice is her legacy. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and yeah, the Mir space station docking had to be very interesting for her. But oh, the long duration exposure facility uh, they deployed, uh, uh, that was the retrieval of that. She was aboard that in 1990, a very important mission. And, of course, operating the shuttle. Uh, kind of love to show some of the space covers that have come out of a shuttle mission. This is her mission that was launched March 4th, STS-62, uh, we talked about in 1994. There's the stamp date of it coming back. The, the postage stamp for when it was launched. And her signature is over there on the right-hand side of the famous shuttle below uh, uh, Sam Gemmar there. So Marsha is the one that I was teasing you about. Here she is in the closeout crew, as, uh, which uh, the closeout crew is seven people. There's uh, Travis Thompson there, second from the left. Uh, the number one lead there. And the number two would always be the astronaut that was on duty, or the ASP, they called it. And uh, they would uh, 
that would they go into the shuttle and do things for the crew beforehand and just seeing an astronaut there in the white room was always reassurance of the time and she did that many many times marcia did did that she said growing up outside philadelphia she wanted to be involved in the space program from age 10. the trigger was alan shepard becoming the first american astronaut in, in 1961 and just weeks after uh yuri gagarin of course um and talking about being in space, uh, here she is uh, today in, in life there, just hanging out like we see our astronauts hanging out here at the Space Center, Marty. Uh, she said her space flights gave her a rare perspective on Earth, of course. You get a feeling of incredible ins insignificance, she said, when you consider the stars. Quote, and going around the Earth in 90 minutes, you don't see borders and you don't see boundaries. You see recognizable parts of the earth like the Sinai Peninsula in the Middle East where people have been killing each other for thousands of years over that piece of land. And it's just a piece of land out the window, unquote. Uh, the, the old idea that the Great Wall of China is the only human object to be seen from space, she discounts as a myth. You can't see the Great Wall, Ivan said. Quote, it's very long and very windy, but it's very narrow and it's got trees around it. You can see things like runways with your naked eye, and you can sometimes see roads at night. Well, what's the former astronaut's verdict? And there's kind of a cool introspective photo of her. Uh, what's her verdict on some space movies? Well, here they are. 2001, A Space Odyssey. Quote, she says, that was pretty good. I signed up for it. And visually, director Stanley Kubrick got a lot of it right, too. Unquote. As for Star Trek and Star Wars, Marcia says, I'm a Trek person. She's a Trekkie. There, Jessica Galloway, our hopeful Trekkie on our show here. And Marcia says, I'm okay with whatever they violate in those movies because it's so out of the realm of close to today. Warp drives and lightsabers in the force, I'm fine with that. But I'm always, but I'll always watch a Star Trek movie. They just make me happy. Well, that's kind of a cool way to think about it. And then as far as Avatar, which I don't know much about Avatar, Marty. Do you? No. no. <laughs> uh, she goes, that was in the fantix, fan, fantastical realm of, quote, if you want to make it up, that's fine with me, unquote. It's an interesting movie, but I'm not a big fan of Avatar. Now, Gravity, with the George Clooney and, uh, uh, oh, I have her name in Mar uh Bullock, Sandra Bullock in there. Uh, did you see Gravity, Marty? No. That movie Gravity? I hated it, Marcia says. There was absolutely nothing correct in that movie. The only thing that was correct was the lighting. Uh, the director invented laws of physics just to violate them. <laughs> and it was crazy. Uh, Sandra Bullock's going from a Chinese space station to the American one or vice versa as... as uh, it's just a, it's just an outrageous thing, uh, like she says. And there's another pretty picture of Marcia there, as the other one was also pretty. She talks about Interstellar with uh, Matthew Conaghy. Quote, they did a really great job because instead of making up what wormholes and black holes looked like, they looked at the real data. And Kip Thorne was the real scientist behind it. They uh, He's a great physicist. Uh, Marsha continues about the movie Interstellar. They gave his data to the digital effects people and they wrote algorithms based on his data. So what you see in that movie wasn't made up. It's based on real data. And that's your Interstellar for you. And of course, a lot of people's favorites out there, including Connie McDaniel, Marty. This is her favorite movie, The Martian. Quote, some of the stuff inside the vehicle and the zero gravity parts and the spacewalking parts were dreadful. But the movie was great, Marcia says. Matt Damon was so much fun to watch. Yeah, right. Just fun to watch, Marcia. Maybe that's why Connie likes that movie so much. Uh, and many women out there. I actually know somebody in the astronaut office at NASA who could be that character of Matt Damon, is what Marcia's saying. I gave the book to him and said, that's you. Uh we made him go see the movie, she says. So she loves it. She likes The Martian, though some of the stuff inside the vehicle uh, 
and the zero gravity parts and spacewalking, she said, were dreadful, which, uh, you know, that's hard to depict from somebody who's been there like Marsha Ivins. So we wanted to say hi to everybody out there. Mars Krawitzki in Poland, Daniel de Jong flying people around the friendly skies, Bill Whiting, Carlton Bailey, Keith Souls watching from, I think you're way out there in the northwest uh, part of our country, Keith. Enjoy your uh, your uh, golden years. Ophelia's watching in uh, France. Uh, Dave Stange, Chris Sauterl, thank you for watching. Steve Hammer, Cynthia Rossi, James Sigler, Hazel Banks. Hey, Hazel. And Charlene Walker are staying curious with us today. And we hope that you enjoyed our tribute to four wonderful, outstanding women of our astronaut corps uh, that have 18 shuttle flights between them. All right, uh, four of them. If you went four into 18, that'd still be uh, over four flights each. So uh, we love it that that uh, there's no difference between women and men in outer space or in the Earth. In fact, I think there's a case to be made that women uh, in many ways, are better astronauts. Uh, they certainly are more detail-oriented than I am at times, Marty. So with that, we thank everyone for watching this edition of Stay Curious. Marty, thank you for a, a great Smooth Streamlabs show today. Tomorrow, we're going to bring you four more women of the month of March to celebrate women's history, some space history uh, being made also this week. So hope that you want to join us. We've, got, again, had a lot of kids in our building promoting our steam education that our coordinator darren roberts does so well marty another 30 kids in the building today learning about uh, leverage and and things like that that are important to any aspect of our space program so uh, we thank darren for reaching out to kids like that we thank our executive director karen conklin for supporting our program and as it goes into our fourth way and we thank you for supporting stay curious and hope that you uh give us a suggestion out there send us a photograph we had three customer uh, three customers three watchers photographs on yesterday and we love hearing from you today we featured carlton bailey in a photograph of the cupola when it was here in kennedy space center and now get out there download the app and see the space station going over your 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 neck of the woods right now from your own backyard as we know spring is springing except out there where they got a lot of snow out there in the rockies but uh, clear nights are still time to get out and look up so i'm mark marquez saying we can't wait to see you again soon to bridge the space between us